So, Fawn, um, I want to get into how you grew up and your family and all that. But before we even get there, can you just tell everyone a little bit about yourself? Who, yes. Yeah. Um, my name is Fawn Goodrich. I'm so loud. Um, my name is Fawn Goodrich. I've been at Foothills for, I think, 29 years. I've been working for Linda Hoffman for 17 of those years and recently started uh, working in the counseling department. Um, my... Did you want more than that? Did you want me to go into my family yet or not? Um, I guess we can, we can pause. Woman of mystery mm -hmm. for now. Um, all right. So, Fawn, you didn't grow up here in San Diego. I grew up in Chicago. In Sh the north Chicago. side of Chicago. Uh -huh. um, and tell us a little bit about your family because I know it's a big family mm -hmm. and had a decent amount of challenges just right from the get-go. Absolutely. Well, oh, I, one other thing about me is I'm married I've been married 33 years to Greg Goodrich and the, the back, back, another bald guy back there. Yeah, nice haircut. <sighs> One of my favorite people. Um, and so, I, as I said, I was born on the north side of Chicago. Um, I was the youngest of five kids. We had three boys and two girls. I was the youngest of those two girls. And my sister really struggled uh, physically and emotionally most of my life. She... Um, my parents really didn't know what to do with her and didn't know how to help me uh, kind of grow up and how to be with her and how to set boundaries and all that kind of things. She was verbally and physically abusive to me. She would push me downstairs. She would, you know, I have scars under my arm from her grabbing me. I mean, just really very mean and abusive. And my parents really felt powerless um, to help me. Uh, my mom, the best thing my mom could tell me was that, Fawn, if you could do unto others as you would have others do unto you, um, she would treat you better. So she would treat you better if you could just be better. And so then in that, underneath that kind of guise, uh, trying to be more acceptable and more lovable and more worthy really became the pattern. And worrying about what everybody else thought became the pattern for my life. And it became a consuming way for me to live. Um. That, first off, just sounds exhausting already. Exhausting. And was this when you were real young, when you were a, a teen? What yeah. ages were Well, it started right away because she struggled immediately in life. So from the moment I can have memories, like I was probably five that I can remember it starting at, and, um, and until I was 26 when I finally drew some lines I had a lot of friends growing up in Chicago, so I was really grateful for those friends, but because of the way that I lived my life, I didn't really understand why they were my friend. I really always thought, like, this rug is going to get pulled out from underneath me. They're going to eventually know who I am, and they're going to leave and not be my friend. And I just kind of really struggled with um, value. I used to hide in closets, and um, I had an apple tree in the backyard. I'd hide in the apple tree. I'd hide under beds, all just to kind of stay out of the fray of what was going on in my home. So, um, just thinking about that for a second, because mm -hmm. we're just <laughs> jumping in. Amen. And you said 26 years. Yep, there was 26 years of that kind of a life with my sister. Which <clears throat> most everyone here, almost everyone here is younger than that. Mm -hmm. And so putting that in perspective, that would be your entire life. Entire life. How, and in the, did you know that you were doing those things in the time and that you were trying to earn this approval or anything like that or not yet? I had no idea. It was just like breathing. It was like air to me. It was just the, it was the only thing that I knew. You know, if you, I don't know, it was the only thing that I knew. I didn't Did know Did you know it was else. exhausting? I knew I was exhausted, but I didn't know what was causing the exhaustion. And I just kept, so trying harder to do better became the way that I lived my life. And their opinion of me yeah. became the, like, who I was and how I was. And that determined my value in life. It really, um, for a long, long time in my life, way longer than I wanted to. Where your mom saying that sounds like there's some Christian background or yep. what did that look like? Were you yep. guys involved in a church? What, we were. We to were what involved degree? in a church. My um, dad um, used to read the word as a young man. And when he married my mom, they, my parents really loved well. Let me just say, even though this was a difficult upbringing, my parents really loved well. They were very loving people. And um, my, my dad took us to church. My, when my mom 
uh, dad decided to go for us to go to church. My mom thought it was just one day. And when we were little, we would go to church in like, you know, full garb, you know what I mean? The gloves and the hat and the boys were in suits and it was a big old thing, right? It wasn't easy. And so the next week, my, my parents, my dad said, okay, we're going to church. He's like, again? I was like, Yes, again. So it was more of a, um, I think more of a, like, it wasn't relational with Christ. It was just more of a, like, I came out of that church knowing the books of the Bible. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. I could say Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, First, Six, Seven. I could quote those, but I had no idea who I was in Christ. I had no idea about a personal relationship with the Lord. So mm-hmm. there wasn't that real life. Yeah. You know what I mean? It was more religious than a real spirit-filled life in any way. So you, you do this, you enter into adulthood still mm-hmm. battling challenges with siblings and mm-hmm. more importantly, just this idea that you have to really earn everyone's approval. Yes. In addition to those things happening to me, we moved to Pennsylvania when I was 13. So I was the youngest. My oldest brothers were really a great source of support for me in my life. But like they went off to college when I was seven because they were 11 years and nine years older than me. So they went off to college. And so it just kind of escalated as they moved out. And we moved to Pennsylvania when I was 13. And kind of all of my fears about being rejected and not having friends really came true for me back there because it was a small town and um, it wasn't fun. My brother, well, we moved out there, so I have three brothers. So my third brother actually got diagnosed schizophrenic, paranoid schizophrenic. And um, we really uh, lost him emotionally and mentally. He's still um, very sick. And so... Well, we were living there. My sister struggling. My sister um, attempted suicide 18 times in her life, from 18 to 37. And my brother um, was often taken away in straitjacket, and um, the pet teams would have to be called. I'd have to sleep with my bedroom door locked, and he would chase my dad around the house with a knife. And so it was a very disruptive, you know, um, out of control. Kind of upbringing like that. You said pet team. That's psychiatric evaluation team. team. Mm-hmm. They come and they, you know, straight jacket them and put them in the pet team. And then he would go away for a month and then he would come back. And But it was very unstable and unsafe. And um, nowadays, if, if you don't know schizophrenia, that there, there's some diagnosis or, or things we could say that mean a very specific thing. Mm-hmm. That doesn't. That could manifest, show itself in, in many different forms. But you're talking about going through this a couple decades ago. Yep. And he's still there. So it's still even then though there there must have been even more questions on more what questions. what is happening? Why is this happening? Your parents are trying to handle that. Yep. And My your sister. sis. Uh-huh. And oh. you're the fifth one. And I'm the fifth one. <laughs> Hiding in the closet just trying to stay out of the fray. <laughs> Staying out of the Um so how does how does that carry into your adulthood? What do you see like looking back that's some difficult stuff to work out, and but you become an adult and you try to start making life decisions, still yeah, carrying all this. Yeah. So um, who I was and how I was was always being defined by who I was with. So it was defined by my family initially, who I was and how I was. If they weren't happy, that and I had to figure out what I needed to do right to correct it. And then after that, making friends, they became the litmus test for who I was and how I was. Um, growing up, I didn't, so when we moved to Pennsylvania, didn't have a lot of friends. And um, the, the kids that did drugs were the only kids that really would hang out with me. So I hung out with them and they were not necessarily the best choices of friends. Um, and then I uh, just made poor choices. I didn't have a boyfriend until later on in high school. And um, when he chose me, I said yes, but uh, he was an incredibly unsafe choice, and I still stayed, even though he was so unsafe. So it, it really made me make just terrible decisions in relationships. And uh, So you continue this, living that way for mm-hmm. a bit, and, and unsafe, our minds are going... A bunch, like in, in many different ways. Just as yeah, physically, where, yeah. emotionally unsafe. Yeah. What uh, is there a rock bottom? What, yes. what how how does yeah. Or and even maybe even before we get there, are there things along the way that make you think this isn't right? This isn't how it's supposed to work? Yes, I knew it wasn't right. So like um, I knew that things were not right. But I always thought the not right was in me. 
So I kept trying harder to do better, but I didn't have the Lord. So I didn't have that revelation about what was really um, true. I didn't have the truth in me is the, is the reality. It's, it's scary to, and you might know someone like this. Uh, and to be fair, you, you could be like this, where you, sure. you grow up knowing of God, maybe knowing qualities about him, but not knowing him knowing mm. the quantitative facts of who God is, but not knowing the qualitative relationship of what it means to be, I've, to know him. Absolutely. I had no idea. I knew that he was the son of God, but I had no idea what that really meant for me and in my life. And he definitely was not the Lord of my life. He was not the decision maker of my life. I had not in any way surrendered my life mm. to him um, until later on in my adulthood. Um, so what interrupted all that? Well, I had been um, married uh, early on, early in my life I'd been married, and um, I was married in my early 20s, and faithfulness was not necessarily his strong suit, and regardless of it, I stayed. I, uh, it was a very painful relationship, and I was the one that felt like um, was constantly wrong in the relationship and but the acceptance really overwhelmed that sense of having acceptance from him really overwhelmed my sense of what was really best for me mm -hmm. and so his opinion again became the measuring stick by which I measured who am I and how am I and I had a child with him and when he couldn't choose me that was one thing but when he couldn't choose my son that was something else. And I remember sitting up in bed. I did not know the Lord at this time. Remember, I just know this much of him, right? I have no personal relationship with him. But I remember uh, waking up in bed one day, and I really, I felt like a crack. And he said, it's over. You can go. And I, every dysfunctional, like, connection I had to him, all this horrible connection that I had with him, so it left overnight, like, mm -hmm. gone. And I felt completely free. So even when I didn't know God, God knew me. Even when I wasn't coming after him, he was coming after me. And it absolutely broke. And um, I really felt free to separate from him and knew that I was either going to stay with him for the rest of my life or my son was three months old. And I said, I'm a cut bait. I gotta run and I can't do this, this anymore because this is going to impact my son. It was different if it impacted me, but if it impacted my child, that was a totally different story. So we separated and divorced, and uh, three years later, I met my husband. Are you in Pennsylvania at this time? I'm here in San Diego, here yeah. San... How did mm -hmm. you get here? Drove. I'm Drove. sorry, just kidding. <laughs> no, I was going to school. <laughs> sorry. Dad, mom joke. I was, I, was, um, go I was going to college in Pennsylvania, and um, I didn't want, I just could not live there anymore. It was yeah. such an oppressive environment. So I just loaded up my little Horizon Omni and, and headed to California. My, fam my brothers were here. My other brother was in Denver. And I just decided to come west and went to San, San, lived in L.A. for a little while and then went to San Diego State. So things are bad there. Mm -hmm. And you get out. Uh -huh. And you come here. And that's where you met your husband? Your yeah, I met ex? my husband here. Sorry. Yeah, I met my yeah. first husband uh -huh, there. And mm -hmm. then... Here. You have this, you're in a codependent relationship. Totally codependent. Which, um, can you define that? You probably could define that better than I can. Well, it's where his needs become more important than my needs. Do you know what I mean? When what they want becomes more important than what you want. Where you're investing more into their life than they're investing into their life. Where you care more than they're caring. It's, that becomes the forefront of your mind instead of at what, and, and to the detriment of your own. Because we do, we love each other, right? You know, really well. But uh, when it becomes to the detriment, your own detriment. So, yeah, and we, the way I see it, and you, you correct me mm -hmm. if I'm, you no, do you, more counseling than no, I do. But I see so often these couples that are in this relationship where they they both know it's bad, um, but they know, but they can't imagine living life without each other because the bad is like this symbiotic bad, like mm -hmm. it just feeds itself on well, there's both there's something, sides. yeah, there's something that's driving you. For me, it was that sense of acceptance, but it wasn't true acceptance. And so I just stayed because that was so much more important to me than my well-being or reality. And there, there's this comfort that we could get in in, uh, mm -hmm. in just terrible places. Yeah. 
And yet it's the comfort we know. Even It's uncomfortable, but we know it. And then the Lord broke through yeah. and he gets you out of that. And a few years later, you meet your husband now. I did. He walked up to my front door, <laughs> which doesn't happen. But he'd walk up to my front door and was measuring for rain gutters, which is what he does. And um, and as we were just sitting there, he was talking to my sister and I'm washing my car and he um, had music playing because I loved music. And so I thought, oh, that's such a nice thing. But he drove away. And again, I don't know the Lord, but the Lord knows me. <laughs> He's chasing after me hard. And all of a sudden I hear this voice in my head saying, wave to him. And I'm like, wave to him? He's a stranger. Why would I wave to him? He's driving away. And why would I wave to him? Because I was kind of, kind of sassy. And uh, all of a sudden, my hand's up and I'm waving at him. I'm thinking, what are you doing? I'm waving at him. And all of a sudden, his brakes go on. And I'm like, oh, shoot. I'm waving at a stranger. And I was... So he realized he hadn't written down any of the measurements that he had measured of my unit. So he came back. He was distracted or something? He was distracted. Uh, not by me, because we hadn't even talked. He'll, his story is, I was totally distracted by you. I just was watching you out of the corner of my eye. That's his story. He's sticking to it. Yeah. And so um, he, he, he you know, came back, and we started to chat. He was a single dad of two boys, and I was a single mom of one. And we started to date and married after that. Now, Greg, at this time... Knows the Lord? Greg knows the Lord, and I do not. And so you meet up, you start talking, start dating, get married. Everything is just rainbows and butterflies from there and on out, no problems? <laughs> yes. It was, it was the opposite of, yeah, no. And so, <laughs> you know, so I, um, I married Greg, and I brought all of that baggage. God bless my husband. I brought all of that baggage into that marriage. And two months after we were married, I really had just put all of my hope into Greg. That's really what I'd done. I really wanted him to be my knight in charming armor. I wanted him to rescue me. All those things, I just put all of that in him and put my stock in him. I really wanted him to be that for me. I was not a believer at the time, except in him. <laughs> that was it. It's the only thing I believed in. And uh, God really had another plan. And um, it was almost like the rug got pulled out from underneath us. Um, and because God had another plan. God didn't want me to put my trust in something other than him. And he knows who I am. I'm really a tough cookie. And so he knew that he had to pull that rug hard and help me to find it in him. And so two months after we got married, I, was, I knew I was in way over my head. And I accepted Christ and gave my life to the Lord. That's cool. Yeah. I, uh, you are in this place where all right, you've sought acceptance in other people and it hasn't worked. Yep. And then you, your savior goes from like, I don't have to put on, like do all the right things. Now I have Greg, he's my savior. And mm -hmm. he pulls the rug out and you get saved. It wasn't that pretty. It was so ugly. What, it was 10 years of ugly for me, 10 years for me, ugly. I, I, I really had no idea of what to do. I think because my, uh, these things really defined me. These determined my identity in my heart through all this process. A lie was really defining my identity. And the lie was rooted in that flawed thought that, Fawn, you are not acceptable. Mm -hmm. You have to perform to be acceptable. That was a lie that was at the root of my life. You know, it was really, really challenging. By, when you say 10 years of ugly, mm -hmm. it's 10 years of breaking down that lie? Breaking down that lie and renewing my mind. And um, I, the circumstances that I was living through really were defining me. And the people that I saw around me here at church really were living with great joy. And I knew that there just had to be something more to this life than I was experiencing to this mm -hmm. life in Christ. And I remember I was just sitting home all day. My kids were be off at school. And I remember just sitting home and watching TV all day. And I heard the Lord say to me, if you could just give me 15 minutes a day. I was like, 
She goes, then you can watch TV all day. I was like, score. Because TV had become my comfort as a kid. That was my coping mechanism to escape and get out of the reality that I was in. So I remember just thinking, okay, great. I'll, I'll give you 15 minutes. I was thinking, how am I going to perform with the Lord? He wants 15 minutes. Okay, I'll do that. And then, you know, be done. And... Well, 15 minutes, he just captured my heart. I joined a Bible study here at church. It was called Heart of God 29 years ago. And um, <clears throat> just started to study the Word. I, you guys, just so you know, Heart of God, you know how we make acronyms for every ministry? <laughs> Don't it's the it. only thing Don't every it. single time I think I of it. We didn't think and about so, that one. Yeah. We're hogs. It wasn't I didn't the say best it. thing for a women's I didn't ministry say it. thing. We didn't think about it. But it has changed. The name changed. It's called Refresh now. <laughs> Which, what is that? I don't know. Refresh. H O G on everything. Just but, say a women's Bible um, study. All right. So, because I, I think you do what is common. We run from one problem. We look to, like, all right, I can't, I can't figure it out. And we learn. And, and you guys, hopefully, you figured it out that you, you can't do it all. And, but then we put our trust in something. Yep. And so for you, it was your ex-husband at first. Yeah. And in your performance. Yep. Or, no, oh, yeah. yeah. Your, yeah, your performance. And then, yep. and then it was in Greg. Yep. But that's not going to work. And, nope. Um, and, and I'm thinking and they're all the problem. I'm like, I'm like, oh, well, you know, that's the problem. But woohoo. But then you give your life to the Lord. Mm -hmm. And it's also easy to be like, all right, I checked that off. I'm, yeah. I'm like... I'm, yeah, but I always knew, yeah, and that wasn't for me because I'm a girl who has a lot of questions, and I'm a girl who I want to live in reality and authenticity, and what was going on was just, was really difficult, and so because the circumstances were so hard, like I got knew, I don't know, I had really hard circumstances in that marriage, and um it was going to take me on my face to pursue him to get through it. There wasn't any like, oh, just an easy life. I could not skip in that marriage. I re it was such difficult circumstances in our marriage that I needed him. I was desperate for him. And so it wasn't just a, I'm saved. I'm, you know, I got fire insurance. So I can needed we, much more yeah. than that. Can we start, let's break down some of those, the ways the Lord revealed the lie that you are under. Mm -hmm. And brought the truth and the healing that came with it. What, what did that look like over that 10-year process? So one of the things, so I joined the Bible study, and I remember when the truth of um, Galatians 2.20, it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me, and the life that I now live, I live by faith in him who gave himself up for me. When that became like, it became like scripture can become, I hope, hope this has happened for you, like just revelatory. I was like, Bleh. it was in such stark contrast to the life that I had been living, that I was no longer defined by my circumstances, but by what he thought about me. I was like, well, isn't that interesting? It's not gonna be by what you think of me, or what you say, or how well I did there, or how bad I did there. It wasn't defined by that, it was defined by him. I was like, that is an interesting concept. So that um, idea of having your identity defined by him, really became the foundation for my life. So I've got a couple of books here that I'm going to um, give away if whoever thinks that they want it. But one of them was um, by Neil Anderson, and it's called Who I Am in Christ. And that book just started to define my life. When th I got that truth into me and what he says about me defines me, not what everybody else thinks about me or says or how well I perform or don't perform on any given day, then you don't live this life. Because all of those things are based upon what, how you're feeling that day and what you're thinking that day. And I could be doing great, but you're having a bad day, so then I'm having a bad day. It wasn't based upon what anybody else thought or felt anymore. It was based upon what he said. And so that became like my foundation, which what made me really unstoppable and yeah. unchangeable and it made me rock solid in my life and and so as the lord's doing this mm -hmm. you have relationships yes that are are changed now well you yeah they're still <clears throat> challenging so yeah. um you have your relationship with greg mm -hmm. and now that's being changed in a mm -hmm. good way but then also your well, siblings I'm being, yeah i'm being changed yeah. which really was what it was about. It wasn't about the relationship changing, because sometimes the relationships don't change. But when you change, it changes the relationship. So I realized, like, I had all these very difficult relationships in my life, and I realized 
I was the common denominator. <laughs> it wasn't them, it was me. And so, I, you know, the one thing you can't change is what's going on in somebody else. What you can change is what's going on inside of you, what's going on in your relationship with the Lord. And sometimes you can help in what's going on between two people, but you can never change what's going on inside of somebody else. So I realized that I was the common denominator in that. And I knew that if I changed, because a lot of people, a lot of times you, people think that like if, well, this can't change until they change. And that, that is a lie from the pit of hell. Everything changes when you change. That's all that has to happen. You're, it's, it, a lot of marriages think that, well, unless he does the counseling, I, we can't save our marriage, and it's not going to work unless he does. That's me mocking women. I'm so sorry. That's a terrible thing. It's, but I, the truth of the matter just is... Just for a note, I didn't mock I women. mocked. I mocked. I just, I'm a woman. I can mock. So. But I just think that is just not, not the case. It's not true that you... It, that your marriage can change or your relationship with your family can change or your relationship with your friends can change if only you change. They don't have to do anything. If you change, it changes. But And you're saying this, and I agree with you 100%, but it, it's interesting because you have siblings also that are, are struggling and that have introduced to you a lot of traumatic memories and difficult things. And so... Uh, Um, you, you didn't mention your sister mm -hmm. was diagnosed as, as bipolar, right? Is yes. That? Yeah. So my sister um, finally got diagnosed as bipolar. And it, so at 26, when I said like how long that relationship took, like yeah. I mean, for me to like kind of get it and change, my sister, um, I lived with my sister for a year, like 24, 25. I lived with her. And when I met Greg and then we got married, I moved out. And at that point, she was furious with me. So it was, our relationship was still very challenging. And at 26, I moved out to get married and move in with Greg. And she was livid with me um, because she's not thinking. She doesn't think, not thinking. Completely. She picked up an iron by the cord. And I said, that, that was it for me. Again, I didn't know the Lord at this time, but he knew me. And so I said, that's enough. Like that's the line for me that I can't be in this relationship until you admit what's happened. You repent you know, for what's been going on. And I just knew those things. I knew that that was just true. Like, I couldn't keep having a relationship like this. I had to set some boundaries. And my family was furious with me, absolutely furious that I would set that kind of boundary. My mom just could not take it that I would set the boundary. You can't do that. You have to still see your sister. And I said, that's not going to happen until she re admits it, repents, and it says, that's enough. Now, you come... It. Now, so then you get married, then you get saved. God reveals all of mm -hmm. this stuff to you. And you just said, in order for a relationship to change, like you have to change. So you well, change. Well, there's certain relationships. There's certain relationships that are toxic that you have to set boundaries with, right? They're not healthy and you have to set boundaries. Sometimes the boundary, mostly boundaries are what you're going to do, right? It's, you're not telling anybody else what they have to do. But in this sense, yeah. when it's a toxic relationship, it is true that you have to set a boundary to say, this is what I need in this relationship. You get to say what yeah. you need in that toxic relationship, and it's really important. Now, I'm not saying you do that in every relationship. I think you know, this boundary issue has gotten a little, you know, <laughs> it, boundaries are about what you're going to do, not you telling somebody else what they're going to do. So I set a boundary yeah. with my sister, and I said, I can't do this, and I held to it. Even in the face of my family, they were no longer the ones that determined who I am and how I am. Um, and he, she said they, she no longer determined who I am and how I am. And so I was able to hold that boundary because what they said no longer impacted me in that way. I knew that I was in the light. I knew that I was in the truth. And I, I, I could not have her yeah. in my life until that happened. And, and I know my question there mm -hmm. probably sounded a little accusatory. But exactly. I think you do this well. And so what I want is you give your life to the Lord then. He changes how you see yourself. You still have this boundary, but you are open for Absolutely. reconciliation. Oh. You're, you're yeah, as soon as that happens, I'm, it's done and done, which eventually took a year and a half. But Can I say this? Go ahead. No, you, got more. Well, I, you, you guys, her sister throws an iron at her, and she's like, yeah, I'm ready to reconcile. Once she says sorry, like, well, a lot of people don't real do repentance. that. Well, it has well, to like, be, you'll know, you know when somebody's sorry, right? It's like, it's not like, Okay, fine. I'm sorry. I'm not talking that kind of sorry. Do you know but what I mean? Even that, like, not, do you guys agree with me? It's just easy for people to be like, never, not going to happen. I'm not making that opportunity. Or I will after I cool down. Or I'm going to give it a few years myself. Um, 
-hmm. But you have these relationships that are, are difficult, they're challenging, and yet, and, and you put up boundaries because that's, that's what right you, what's mm -hmm. right, um, but you're willing to love. Anyways. When, when they haven't loved, they well, haven't. I can, lo I can love you and not have you in my life, mm -hmm. and I can love you um, and have you in my life. Do you know what I mean? So mm -hmm. when true repentance happens, you will know. It's just, it's a spiritual thing when that happens. And so when she repented, like, I'm a sinner. <laughs> Who am I if God gives me that love to not then give it out and me to say, well, <laughs> be on some high horse. Yeah. I'm a sinner. Christ loved us while we were yet sinners. You know what I mean? He found me while I was a dog. Yeah. And who am I to say, like, I'm not going to love you. If you repent, it's done and done. Isn't that what he does with us? Like, done and done. It's finished. And I also knew that I could set boundaries now. I knew that I could protect myself. I knew, I knew that he had healed me of that rejection that I felt. I think as long as we feel rejection and afraid that we can't protect ourselves and resentment and all that stuff, then we're not going to be able to do it. It's true. But when you can truly forgive and you can truly recognize like, I'm a sinner, you're a sinner, I'm, I'm going to love you. You know what I mean? In spite of that, um, while that's still true, I was loved that way. I can give that love out. He's the source of that love. I can do that. And I also knew that I could risk again because I was over that rejection about yeah. who I was. I, they were no longer defining me. And once you can get over that rejection, then you can risk again. As long as you feel that pain and that rejection and all those things that you feel from that stuff, then it's going to be difficult to do it. But when you, you know you're healed from that pain and those things, when you can risk again. And so it took a year and a half, but she did. She finally came to me and uh, said, I'm so sorry. I did this to you your entire life. I am so sorry that I did that to you your entire life. You're absolutely right, and I am so sorry, and that's never going to happen again. And done and done. So we invited her. My husband and I invited her back into our life. And about seven years, but she would come over to my house. She was really upset that I had accepted Christ because when you accept Christ, lots of things change, right? I'm no longer pro-abortion. I'm pro-life. I'm no, I'm a Christian. I, you know, don't believe in, you know, woman power. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm, she's changing me all the time, right? I'm a completely different human being. And she was like freaked out, like, you are crazy. How could you believe this stuff? And so um, for about seven years, she would come to our house. We'd invite her over for dinner every Friday. And she would come over and she would just kind of, you know, argue with me and yell at me about it. But I was like, okay, I love you. And I'd kiss her and smooch her and send her on her way, right? And then she'd come back the next Friday and she'd argue with me and yell at me about it. How could you possibly think this? And I was like, this is what I believe. Let me tell you. I'd share the gospel with her and she would leave mad. So for seven years, we did that kind of thing. But at the same time... And this was a good part of your relationship. This was, this was great. I was like, yeah, are you kidding? It was fantastic. I was so glad to get to have this conversation with her and her not be you know, violent or anything. I can argue with the best. It doesn't, that doesn't bother me at all. So we were, um, this happened, well, seven years later, you know, God, of course, is drawing her and sending all these people into her life. And seven years later, she accepted Christ. And a year later, she went on the mission field and was on the mission field for 20 years. And while she was there on the mission field, so she, from that 18 years old until 38, she, um, 18 suicide attempts every single year. She would attempt suicide and have to be hospitalized for a month and then come back out. And so really, really challenging life. But when she went on the mission field, she was in Croatia. And while she was in Croatia, they put her on a medication, a different medication, because she got sick one more time. They put her on a medication that they don't really put you on here in the United States because it's highly regulated. But they put it on her there, and she never got sick again. Mm. Um, and so I just think I'm so grateful that the Lord gave me whatever it was they gave me, to love well, you know what I mean, to care well meant that, you know, uh, I was a piece. He was sending people all around her path, but I could be a one piece of that pie was a really wonderful, yeah. I feel grateful. How, how do you live now differently? I mean, you're, it's been years now walking in this new identity. Yeah. And looking back and seeing how lost you were and how you were striving. If you could just wrap up yeah. how life di is different now, 
How would you? How well, would you I don't take this? things personally anymore. Do you know what I mean? Like I used to. I think when things happen to us, we take them so deeply personally. But most of the time, when you're having a difficult time with people, most of the time it's because of something that's going on inside of them. And so, if we can understand that, yet yeah, while we were sinners, Christ loved us and mm -hmm. love other people that way, that would be. I think that's a great, uh, a really important dynamic. I think it's really important, one, to get healthy yourself because it's, you know, hurt people hurt people, right? And you're not going to be able to do this if you have that, those kinds of pain and rejection and all that stuff inside of you, which, which just comes with life. It comes with junior high. It just comes in our life, right? So if we allow ourselves to get as healthy as we possibly can, I read another book, it's called Keep Your Love On by Danny Silk, and I have that up here too, but it taught me like how, what the, the purpose of relationship. It taught me how to communicate well because I was a very passive communicator. I had to learn these skill sets to really learn how to do relationship well because I had all this difficulty in my life, but I needed to get better. I needed to change. And it taught me how to set real boundaries and how to yeah. do that and hold those kinds of boundaries. There's really... I'm sorry, were you going to ask something no, else? No. There's a real... You know, like if you think about it, that there's a cause in them that's why they're doing it. If you can remember, there's something inside of them that's causing this rejection from them or making them difficult for you. It's something inside of them. Then it, it doesn't become so personal anymore. Do you know what I mean? If you know that, then you can have compassion and then you can have grace maybe for that person. You also have to know that it's inevitable. I mean, if they did this to Christ, think about Christ, if they did, they rejected him, why would we not be rejected? It's going to come and it's going to happen. And if you know that it's inevitable, it's not personal to you. It's not a mm -hmm. personal issue. Relationships being difficult is a design feature. It's not a flaw. The relationships, marriage, friendships, parent relationships are like the most beautiful sanctification process. And if we understand that, then when they do become difficult, you don't think that something's wrong. See, my mom always told me, I don't understand why marriage is so difficult. I think marriage is so easy. And I, so when my marriage was hard, I thought something was wrong. Mm. But marriage is difficult by design sometimes because it's trying to change and transform and sanctify yeah. you. And so if we can look at it in a different way, that it's not everybody else, but look inward and think, okay, what do I need to do to be different? What do I need to do to be changed? And allow the Lord to do that transformation in you. If you really could humble yourself and allow that transformation... It is. I am telling you, this life of freedom, of not being controlled by relationships, is the sweetest sleep and the sweetest life. It's like living yeah. debt-free. You know what I mean? That life, debt-free life, the most beautiful sleep you ever get. Really, conflict, you like just be able to live free and in love in relationships, to be able to set boundaries and do that. I'm telling you, it is a really free life. And so... I just want you to know if there's anybody that wants to talk, I have two books. I'd love to give them away if anybody thinks that they want them to keep your love on, how to communicate, connect, and set boundaries, and the other one about your identity. We would love to give them away to you. And if anybody yeah. wants one and didn't get it, we'll, we'll get you one. But um, Do you, um, I didn't tease this earlier, but it, do you, is there one or two questions out here that you guys have for Fawn that you'd like to ask? Just have time for maybe a couple if, if there are any, no worries if there's not. And if you don't want to say yeah. them now, you don't have to say them now. You can come up to me later. Or you can, my phone's in the directory. You can call me. <laughs> the, well, I don't know. Yes, I mean, can. this is going to go on YouTube, though. It might go on YouTube. We might, oh. I don't know. Please don't. Don't call me. All right. You're not a foothillian. Don't call me. Area code 958. <laughs> Area code 858. There we go. <laughs> um, hey, um, two things. Ladies, Fawn's also going to be at the women's conference. And so if you want to get, her, get to know her more there, you've got to um, bug her. Uh, any last, last piece of advice to these young adults? They're, um, they're just in the midst of, you, you guys are in the season of finding good relationships, building them, um, I mean, I just think you guys are in the midst of a lot of it. Any last minute words of advice? We can have the band come up. Um, I think just that the, the take, sorry, that takeaway was that just remember, it's really not personal, although it feels personal. Like you think of my sister swinging an iron at me. It feels really personal, right? And it was not personal. It had all to do with what was going on inside of her. 
did not have to do with what was going on, what was who I was. And I know that it doesn't mean that it doesn't hurt. And that's why it's so important to have the Holy Spirit to help you through that process because you, you it's going to hurt. It's painful. It's hard. I'm not no I'm not making light of how difficult this has been. But with him and by the power of the Holy Spirit, he can change and transform you so that you can then be different in relationships, even if those things never change. It reminds me of um, this weekend, I'm, I mentioned, if, if you guys were at service, the Youth Venture Kids and how it came off one way, but once we have God's perspective, we, we see other people different. And I, I think the one big part of your life is making sure that you had God's perspective of you and then that you walked with that perspective of others. Absolutely. And not to judge that because I, I, I'm, not, I'm not the judge of that. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I don't know what's going on in them. You ever have somebody like speed by you and you're thinking, what is wrong with you? Why are you speeding? Well, if you only knew what was going on inside that car, do you know what I mean? They're you know, their wife's having a baby or their dad's dying or, you know what I mean? There's always a cause inside whatever it is that's going on around you. And if you could mm -hmm. live in that kind of grace, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? We, we want to be judged by, we want to judge people by what they do, but we want to be judged by our intentions. Mm -hmm. But we need to, to know that there's always a cause going on inside of somebody yeah. else.